This is basically the, the solo violin version and it goes on with this repeated rhythm and this kind of feeling for stability and meditation. I always thought this piece was incredible because of that sort of trance that it brings you into through the repetition of the rhythm and through the incredibly beautiful voyage through the harmonies of the piece. And I always wanted to play it on the piano. Finally made that dream come true and I made my own arrangement for solo piano. And I'm certainly jealous of everybody who's German from coming from the same country as Bach and Beethoven, you know. But I think that, well, going back to the Vikings, you know, they're, they're voyagers. You know, they, they, they travel the world to, 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 to bring a message, whatever the message is. And, and I have that in common with them. And I think that when it comes to giving and taking, that is the idea of interpretive art. You're taking a message from somebody else and you're making it your own. So it becomes a meeting between you and the creator of that message, whether that's Bach or Beethoven or Brahms or Schoenberg or whoever. So it's not just Bach's world or Beethoven's world that I am a guest in, but I'm rather making them to some degree a part of my world as well. I like the repetition of that piece by Bach, the prelude in B minor. I like the, the right hand on the, on the piano, it just goes on and on. And it's starting to feel this kind of factory work when you have the kind of band. And, and I thought, I want to bring Bach you know, to Iceland in that sense. And there was a beautiful story about a fish factory where they actually had a grand piano in the canteen. Uh, because the owner of the uh, fish factory loved music and he wanted the best for his workers so people could play concerts there and play during factory hours. I like that so much. And you know in those factories people are always listening to music and some of them are actually listening to Bach. So I thought this is very lo logical and I wanted to uh, actually tell a little short story in that film. Um, you know, and it's a story about a man who changes his life in a certain spot in the music where things really are transformed and transfigured. It's a uh Maybe part of that is because I don't come from a country of that kind of tradition of the, let's say, the Russian piano school or something like that, where you, there is really a system and, and a way of tradition of doing it. There is no Icelandic piano school. Um, <laughs> there is no tradition for that kind of piano playing in Iceland. But I'm also, I'm a son of a composer and I composed myself quite a lot. And I like to approach music from a composer's perspective if I can. So I try to imagine the creative process of the composer and to play it from that side. So when you have to commit to one way with classical music, it's kind of working against the nature of the music because the nature of classical music and the masterpieces is that they can be redefined with every new generation and every performer if people go deep enough.
play music like this, like a folk song, which Bela Bartok has transcribed so beautifully, I think you go into something very special. You go into the collective experience of a lot of people, a nation, a society. Because folk songs like this, they cannot be composed. They can only be created and formed together by generation after generation after generation of grandmothers singing to their children. And with this kind of piece, it's so, it's so special, this melody. Because it's always stopping and starting and stopping and it's so clearly like language, like sentences, you know, speaking and telling a story. Where do we go? We go into, we go to Hungary, but we go to Hungary created in our minds, you know. This is one of the most beautiful folk songs I know and it's perfect from Bartok because he's just taken this unusual melody and put these gloriously beautiful harmonies to it. But you get to some very, something very special. You get to grandmothers singing to their children who then sing to their grandchildren. You get to a chain of experience. I'll play you, because I've just played this Hungarian folk song, I'll play you an Icelandic folk song, which is the most beautiful Icelandic folk song I know. It's about death, like so many Icelandic folk songs. <laughs> so it's about the old farmer who is sowing seeds into the ground and contemplating that when the seeds will have grown, he will be under that very ground. He will no longer be alive. It's called Where Life and Death May Dwell. There were some musicologists who traveled the country then, so shortly after the Second World War, and they recorded these farmers who had learned these songs from their mothers and fathers, who had learned them from their mothers and fathers. And so there are, I can't remember, 2,000 songs or something like that, and this one is particularly beautiful. Many of them are about hunger and death and darkness and ghosts and all the difficult things because life on this island was so impossible. <laughs> This album is my nostalgia album. It's a nostalgia for my childhood and it's music that often has a certain kind of yearning. It's a dark album, it's on the soft side and it's certainly my slowest and most tranquil album. It's my album of the night, Nocturne album. Um, but my Nocturnes are by Kurtak and by <laughs> Schumann and, and by Brahms and Icelandic folk songs. I love um, everything I play on the piano. The piano for me is the greatest instrument when it's played in a certain way, which creates this kind of feeling for third dimensionality space uh, in the sound. So when you play the piano, I think ideally you should have many different layerings of, of color and texture, and it should be like a 16th century uh, landscape painting where you really have the distance and then you have something closer to the foreground and you have the real foreground but you really feel the painting opens up. The sound of the piano should do the same, it should open up and become kind of its own space to invite people to go into it rather than being an in-your-face presentation.
I think my path to music is like Freudian. Uh, my mother was a, she was a piano student when she was pregnant with me, and she was actually here in Berlin uh, doing her soloist exam in the university, playing Appassionata by Beethoven and Chopin and all these things with me, six months, I think, pregnant. I was inside her, the keys were here, so absolutely very close to the keys. So I like the idea of that. Does it have any truth? I have no idea. But there was music in my home. And I think one of the most important moments in my musical life happened before I was born. Uh, it was the fact that my parents spent all of their money and even took a loan uh, to buy a Steinway grand piano before they bought apartment. It's a beautiful thing and it's a crazy economic decision from them. But so we had an amazing new Steinway Model B in my living room in this tiny basement that we lived in the first seven years of my life where I shared a room with my two sisters and the piano was the apartment. My path was, I thought it was very long, you know, and very bumpy, uh, but I took a different path than many. I didn't do the piano competitions, and I, because I really don't, fundamentally, I, I don't believe in them creatively. And I come, come from Iceland, so with my talent, I couldn't still call anyone for introduction to anyone else, because there was no Icelandic conductor on the international scene, there was no Icelandic soloist anywhere on the international scene, there was no one to introduce me to management. So I felt it was a very slow path. But I tried to play every concert like it was my Carnegie Hall debut or Berlin Philharmonic debut. I really tried to play those concerts like my life depended on it. And in a way, my life did depend on it. And then finally, 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 um, someone listened to me, Vladimir Ashkenazi, and immediately wanted to support me and decided to invite me to, to play with him while he was conducting. And we did the opening of Harpa Concert House in Iceland, which is where I record all my Deutsche Grammophon albums. I got my Deutsche Grammophon contract when I was 32. I do think in terms of distance and sound. And in Iceland it's very interesting with distance because we don't have almost any trees. <laughs> so, so you just go up on one of those hills, you know, in the southwest of the country, you know, go up two, three hundred meters and then just look around and you see like immense amount of land and you can see so far and, and, and you actually get that feeling. So perhaps that has become part of me, I don't know. <laughs> 